I'm here. Welcome, everybody. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds, change the life from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive, it is time we lead ourselves into the world. back folks to part two of this orientation to powers climate justice and jobs work and also welcome to people who are watching the recording after the fact this is being recorded again i'm julie greenberg director of powers climate justice and jobs work and just to summarize from our first session power is a faith-filled organizing force in pennsylvania for racial and economic justice on a livable planet we see the intersection, the collision of climate crisis and extreme inequality. And when we look at how that affects people, it might look like separate siloed issues, like these people struggling with flooding, these people struggling with not having internet access, these people struggling with food insecurity. But when we actually look at the roots of all the separate siloed issues, we see two major intertwined forces shaping these seemingly separate issues. We see the unbridled drive for profit over people and planet in this world. And we see the commitment to white supremacy and the use of racialized violence to protect white supremacy and white property. Power does all of its work through a lens of racial and economic justice. And I want to talk more today about how we do the climate work in that way. In organizing, we talk about 
momentum moments where the world rises up in just outrage and upset. And we, we've seen that many times. We've lived through it. Arab Spring, Occupy, Black Lives Matter, just times when something happens that's so terrible and so triggering and there's an uprising. And those are called momentum moments. And one of the things that power does is it pays attention to those momentum moments. But what we really want to do is take that grief and rage and despair and channel it into campaigns for change. Otherwise, we see what happens with things like Arab Spring or Occupy, where you know there's a massive uprising, but the change isn't actually transformational and sustainable. It makes the contribution and it puts something on the agenda. But what we also need to win specific victories to change people's lives. And so some combination of those momentum moments and actual organizing of strategic escalating campaigns with targets and with visible victories matters. And so we're going to talk more about how we do that. How do we choose a campaign? What are our campaigns? That's what we're going to talk about today. Overall, what we're doing is for a socially just, sustainable future. We're contesting. So it's kind of a struggle and we're organizing people to take part in that struggle and to win. And we use, the climate justice team uses a moral framework that we do all of our work through. It's, it's again, it's a resource under the tab uh, at Power's website, the um, climate justice and jobs team tab, tab. And then it's a resource and you can see our moral framework, which has five planks. And there are things like you know, racial justice, economic justice, a just transition, which means supporting workers who were in the fossil fuel industry and now need to not have those jobs because that industry has to end basically and it cannot expand one step further. So who, what's gonna happen to those workers who were employed and that's their livelihood. And so a just transition, a fair transition is talking about investing in that transition for workers so that they can have um, good paid renewable energy jobs with unions. So you can see what those five plays. So we use that big framework and we work a lot in coalition with partners, with any partner who's willing to work through that moral framework to join us in that big framework for our work, our more, what we call the moral framework for building the climate just beloved community. And you can see it there. It also is in our Change the Climate presentation that I talked about last week. But then in choosing a campaign, we also look at some other things. And Rory is going to screen share the list of things we look at. And we're just going to talk about uh, these kind of criteria for choosing what campaigns we take on. Thank you, Rory. Is it possible to make it any bigger? So could we have a volunteer who would read these um, topics that we would consider in evaluating a campaign? Is there this issue, will working on this issue result in a concrete, meaningful improvement in people's lives? Do you want me to keep going? Yeah, can you, can you speak any louder? Not really. I'm, I'm, uh, in a shared space in a, in a house right now. Um, is that better? Yeah, much better. Build leadership among your members after the relations of power, alter the relations of power, winnable, widely felt, deeply felt, easy to understand, have a clear target, nameable, accessible person with the power to give you what you want, have a clear time frame that works for your people organization, Unifying, attract new people, set your organization up for the next campaign, have a pocketbook angle, does it address allocation of resources, will it improve people's economic situations, help us to raise money, consistent with our organization's values and vision, has a clear moral dimension, clear right and wrong, provides opportunities to connect our favorite, our faith symbols, rituals, scripture, traditions, music, et cetera. Did the people most impacted by this issue have a saying in choosing it? Is the issue rooted in research? 
Thank you. We can go back to our gallery view so we can see each other. So any thoughts or questions about that? That's a lot. And you know, it also sort of matters what's moving in the world. But the part of the idea of creating a, ta a ta um, specific campaign is that you can't just win a green transi transition. What does it mean? You know, you, those are just sort of too big. It's too global. What does it mean really to win a green transition? So you have to slice the issues in different ways. And then you're picking a topic, a target for a campaign. Uh, does anybody want to comment or ask questions about that? And um, yes, that can be shared with this with this list. And I think Rory can do that. Our Julie, is there is there like a metric to this? Like you have to have seventy five percent of these this list be yes, or is it really just a, a guide to make the decision? That's a really good question, and that's really what we wrestle with on the team level or on the working group level if it's a working group doing it. So th those conversations, that's a conversation. It's a dialogue. Like what's more important here? What's possible? What's what are our allies doing and inviting us into? What's moving? Like right now in the state, there's some things moving. And so we have to decide, is this our struggle? This particular thing that's moving right now, like a bill that's in the legislature or an opportunity? And I'm going to talk more about that. But th so we do, it's a conversation. There's obviously not just a way you can say like, you know, it's not like a chemistry formula in a way where you measure this exactly and you measure that and you put it together and it comes out being correct. Um, Okay, well, Rory, we'll have to send this after the fact because um, there's an access issue. So we'll, we'll send that. So, um, that's, what the, that's what you do when you step in, you're part of that dialogue, kind of weighing it and we figure it out together. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the work we're actually doing right now. So that's kind of how we choose a campaign. And I'm going to talk now about the campaigns we're actually engaging in at this moment. We work both at the local Philadelphia level, at the regional level of southeastern Pennsylvania, and at the state level. And all those levels are incredibly important. And there are different campaigns at each of the levels. And I'm actually going to start with a big thing that's coming down the line right now. And you'll hear more about it at the next team meeting as well, because this is very much moving in our state right now. It's called REGI, spelled with capital letters, R-G-G-I. REGI stands for the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And what it is, is a carbon market where a, a state joins Reggie and then carbon in that state has a price. And any industry that wants to emit carbon has to pay to emit that carbon. This is important because it is carbon that you know, is produced by fossil fuels, and that is what is overheating the planet and destabilizing the planet. There are 10 states that are in Reggie, and Pennsylvania is the last of the 10th, which happens to be kind of geographically right in the middle of this geography that hasn't yet joined. This year, our governor decided to put us in Reggie, and now we're in the two-year rulemaking process about how Reggie will work before it actually begins. I'm going to use this as an example of the difference between just getting carbon out of the air and doing a racial and economic justice um, equity-focused practice. We have a lot of big green allies who are getting carbon out of the air, and that is really important. But we bring that equity lens to the issue. And here's how it looks different. So over a 10 state region, if you just take carbon out of the air, overall in a general way, you reduce carbon emissions, which the hope is that Reggie would do. It doesn't actually help people who are in specifically targeted and impacted places. A lot of black and brown and low income communities have been already overburdened with pollution toxins, there's already harm that's been done. And so those places need to be repaired. Those 
voices need to be heard. It's a sort of specific site-based emission question, not just a general 10 state, let's get carbon out of the air. Do you see the difference there in that equity analysis is you have to look exactly at how it impacts who on a community level. So we're bringing that, that equity lens into the conversation. Power is at the table with this, with the kind of environmental protection. We're at the table with the rule makers. But we need to really build power in order to have enough clout to be listened to. So, so far, there's a lot of people thinking about this Reggie thing from all different perspectives, and the frackers are very much against it. This is a big fracking state, and most of the state legislature is in the grip of the frackers' hands. So it's very, very much controlled by the fossil fuel industry, and those people are against Reggie. So it will be a fight to even get anything for Reggie. And we're at the table, and the big moral decision just thinks like, well, at what point do you just kind of throw down and say, we're not going to help pass this thing because it doesn't have enough equity features, and we're going to be against it. And then the frackers will be against it from one side, and the, you know, the equity flank will be against it from the other side, and Reggie will lose. Are we better off or worse off if we don't? You know? So it's complicated, and this, these are the kind of moral decisions we make as we're in the fray of doing the work. Right now, we're at the table, we're raising equity concerns, we're like legally weighing in with comments and signing letters, and you know, we're really out there doing it. And this issue is heating up in these next few months. There will be hearings, and it's very much alive in this state. And we're going to be doing education with our team and with our congregations as much as we can to engage people in this Reggie issue. We are not terribly enamored of carbon markets to start with, because it's kind of like using tool that, of capitalism to create the exact problems that capitalism keeps creating. You know, it's, it's, so we, that's not really ultimately much of a solution, but we're really interested in the income that will come from Reggie. Because once Reggie is set up and running, it's going to make $400 million a year for the state of Pennsylvania. These are huge resources. And so our questions about Reggie are things like, who will get to make decisions about that money? You know, which communities will have access to that money? For what? Will, will harm that's already been done be repaired? Will we be able to build green stream training programs and actual employment in renewable energy? And how do we help design the rules for this so they can't be kind of co-opted and corrupted by the fossil fuel industry, which comes in and is very quite nefarious and wily? We also have to, on an equity basis, be thinking about communities that are completely dependent on fossil fuel, either coal mining or um, fracking, for instance. And as these kinds of sources of energy that create these toxic emissions will be taxed and hopefully will be used less, these communities are dependent in huge part for their libraries, their public schools, their entire tax base on those industries. So again, how do we really think about people out there in mostly rural communities or small town communities who are dependent on a fossil fuel industry and having a transition plan? What will the investment from Reggie be in those communities to sustain local government and local services? And if you think about it, to win a winning coalition, we have to think about all these different interests. So this is a huge organizing issue in the state right now. Nora, who's in this circle right here, is going to be taking the organizing lead for power, working closely with me and with our allies across the state on this. And you'll be hearing a lot more about Reggie. And we will be talking about it at our next team meeting at the end of July. At this moment, are there any other questions about Reggie? It's a good um, campaign to explain the difference between just being environmental versus doing environmental justice. And we are definitely the equity flank of this conversation. So big picture, that's kind of one of our big campaigns moving at the state level. Any questions or comments on Reggie right now? Okay. So moving on to some of our local campaigns. I'm not sure what order to talk about them in 
I'll, I'll talk about one that um, is going to be surging that's incredibly important and power has not had huge capacity to engage in it other than sitting at a table talking about it, but we hope to um, bring more resources to this campaign. PGW is our public utility gas company in Philadelphia. So PGW brings gas into people's homes for heating and cooking. It serves 500,000 people. So it's a big, you know, kind of energy chunk of what happens in Philadelphia. And we have a loose coalition in Philadelphia um, plan for PGW. Right now, our liaisons to that are Steve Greenspan and Russell Hicks from our team. Terry and I also attend those meetings. Terry's gonna be taking a different portfolio, but I will continue being in that loop. And we will be hearing more about that. Where it stands right now is that a lot of these things get kind of technical and in the weeds, but I'll just give a summary of this. Last year, PGW was offered a liquid and natural gas plant for free from the frackers. Why do you think the frackers wanted to give PGW a free liquid and natural gas installation on PGW's land in Philadelphia? What would be the interest of the frackers in donating a processing plant to our public gas utility? Track the money here, folks. What, why would the frackers want to do that? The fossil fuel industry offering up a tax write-off. To be tax write-off, well, what is it they want to sell to this gas plant that would be processed there? Shale gas, basically, right? They, they have a huge profit-driven interest in selling what they frack to be processed at this gas Julie, I don't know if this is just for me, but you're picking up. She has really low bandwidth, so it's to PGW. I'm sure the weather's not helping. Okay, I seem to have somewhat unstable internet here. I apologize, folks. I don't know why we're having this trouble. But, okay, it's a So was it going to cost the taxpayers any extra money? Is it, I mean, is a free gift going to cost anybody anything? Nothing is free, but of course they're going to make a lot of profit off of it. Right. The frackers were going to make a lot of profit, but from PGW's little very time, you know, immediate analysis of, is it going to cost an extra penny? No, it's free. So what did PGW want to say about getting a free LNG plant for its property? They analyzed it and they wanted to say yes, but they had to get approval from city council. So power decided to contest at the city council level because it's a place where we have more leverage, sort of a democratic space where we maybe could get press attention, we could speak to our representatives about saying, you know, approving or not approving PGW's request to do this thing. Because in, in PGW's financial analysis, they had to say yes, because it was free. It wouldn't cost anybody anything. So we did contest this for every single Thursday morning for an entire semester. We helped pack city council hearings it's a huge pain. It's like democracy in inaction because these hearings drag on and on. They're not, it wasn't the hearings. It was the city council sessions. 
you know, five hours long. They don't tell you which time of day the thing is actually being discussed. You're like wasting your time. People are taking off work. The city council people aren't even necessarily there listening. They kind of wander in, they wander out. Really a pain, but we did it. We were there. We bonded with our council people. We testified repeatedly. Our allies testified repeatedly. And in the end, that liquid and natural gas plant was approved, but we wrested a victory from the ashes, which is that we won a funded public study on a green transition for PGW. Like PGW, I mean, the city council committed a pot of money to hire an expert to write a report on what a green transition would look like, which is something we really need because it's very technical. How would people get heat and cooking in their homes if we didn't use natural gas, which is a toxic fossil fuel. We need that information. So we won that. And then the issue was, well, who's gonna get input into like, what are the benchmarks for that study? Who's reviewing that study before it goes public? All those kind of things. Like, are we really gonna be at the table having a voice with our communities? And we won those things. And then an RFP went out uh, to hire an expert to write this study. By the city council put that out. And just then COVID hit and all hiring was frozen. So that was put on hold for a few months. Meanwhile, our loose coalition all wrote together and signed on to a letter to the Office of Sustainability, which is running this whole process for the city government, our expectations of this study. And we again won that we're gonna to get to review it before it goes public. It's gonna take into account these specific things that we cared about. And just now hiring has been reopened. So that process will hopefully move forward. And this, there's a lot going on in the PGW piece right now. You may have seen the team message yesterday, big victory that in a PGW rate hearing, um, a judge, a, an administrative law judge for the first time ever, is requiring the PUC that regulates both PGW and PICO to take into account arguments about climate crisis. We've been raising these issues for years. That you can, you know, all of our energy decisions right now are being made in Pennsylvania with no consideration for the fact that we're living in a dire, desperate, very short window of opportunity to change our energy decisions before we have escalating impacts on our Earth's sustainability. So nobody's making our energy decisions so far, up until now they're gonna to have to, has been listening to arguments about climate crisis. They just don't have to take that into account. It's kind of shocking in this world. Do you think that is shocking? But as of yesterday, now the, the Public Utility Commission, the PUC, which regulates our energy industries in Pennsylvania, has to take into account our arguments when we make them. We still have to make them, but they now have to. It's just a huge, small step victory along a very long haul path, but we've got to celebrate every moment. So that's one of our local campaigns, the PGW work. Another local campaign, that also connects with the PUC, because it's another place regulated by the PUC, is our privately owned electric utility, PICO. PICO serves about a five county area surrounding Pennsylvania. And we have been full force in a campaign called the Power Local Green Jobs Campaign. Power Local Green Jobs, we share it with our faith-based allies, the Earthquaker action team, Equate, spelled E-Q-A-T in all capital letters. Power and Equate run this campaign, the Power Local Jobs campaign. And Linda, who's here in this circle, is in a congregation of friends, Quaker congregation. Um, Equate mostly organizes Quakers through congregations, and some of those congregations overlap with Power's congregation. So Linda is a, a nice um, overlapping foot in each, in each um, organization that shares that campaign. And actually our team co-chair right now, Nancy Weigand, is also um, in both spaces. And there's a lot of love and a lot of um, 
great work between Equate and Power. We've all learned from each other and grown together and we run a really amazing campaign together. This campaign has been pressuring PICO, our big electric utility, to, to source 20% local solar energy by 2025. This is a modest goal, if you think about it. I mean, the whole world has to move to 100% renewable energy in the next few years. We're asking for 20% local solar energy in their procurement plan. PICO has to apply an, a, to the PUC with a proposal for how it would like to be regulated for the next four years. Every four years, they have to propose a regulation plan, and then the PUC has to say yes or no. Usually, this is somewhat of a secret backroom deal. No one ever knows anything about it, and the PUC kind of rubber stamps whatever PICO wants. This year, our campaign decided to shine a huge light on that secret backroom process and to contest with the PUC for our energy future, contest about how PICO is regulated. And so very recently, um, this summer, June 9th, we, had, we took part in a hearing on PICO's energy proposal called the DSP, the Default Service Plan, about how PICO would like to be regulated over the next four years. And there were 80 people testifying against PICO's proposal, which is a shockingly small vision for our energy future. I mean, some people here may already know, but anybody want to take a guess how much solar energy PICO would like to offer up in its energy procurement pie over the next four years? What would PICO like to do? Anybody have a guess? 0.05%. Yeah, if you already know, it's really not fair. But when you ask most people out in our communities, you know, how much solar energy do you think right now in the context of climate crisis, PICO's um, planning to procure? And people will say things like, oh, maybe 50%, 25%, or 10%. It's just really hard to think as small as PICO is thinking here. PICO's proposal is to source 0.5 of 1% of its energy pie from solar energy. And it's not even mostly local solar energy, it's shipped in from some other place. We want local solar energy to build green jobs here. Like solar is a very local, potentially transformative industry, depending on who gets to produce it and own it and then sell it to Pico. There's lots more to be said about that campaign, which is also um, surging. And we have a PUC strategy for both PGW and PICO. So that's, you know, kind of learning more about the PUC, which four out of five of the commissioners are directly from the fossil fuel industry. So it's a big struggle. But I will just say one more thing about the Power Local Green Jobs campaign that people sometimes ask about. It is a demand side campaign. If PICO would demand more local solar energy because they need more for their procurement plan, we do think that a local market would spring up to offer more renewable energy. And what we've seen in our research in the past in some places, some of our sister places across the country, is that some places do green stream training programs where they train people to do solar energy, but then there isn't the demand because the utilities aren't required to actually buy solar energy. And that's the big places. Look, solar energy on an individual's rooftop is good, but it isn't like a transformation of a system of energy procurement. So we need our big energy leaders like PICO, like PGW, to have green transition plans a green renewable energy vision. And so it's what's called a demand side campaign. You know, we're also interested in training programs and we actually won from PICO a slight investment in a training program for solar energy, which is good, but it's not a bold, big transformative shift in what's happening locally. It's not a systemic shift for PICO to do some charitable giving to a little solar energy training. You know, that's not really what we're talking. We're not talking about philanthropy. We're talking about climate justice here. So in a nutshell, that's our Power Local Green Jobs campaign. Any questions or comments about that?
And again, you can see how we bring the racial and economic justice and the um, climate issues together into intersectional relationships. This campaign was chosen because it was a way to build green jobs and a transition that would help build healthy communities and prevent the destabilization of communities that are most impacted by environmental racism. So we looked exactly at that intersection, at taking jobs where they are most needed in our city, good jobs, renewable energy jobs, and building that into a plan for you know, what do healthy communities need. So out of our four local campaigns right now, we've covered PICO. I have a question, Julie, um, regarding the PICO campaign. Um, what is, what would you say, I mean, is there anything being done on the side of the, how, like, in getting it, are things like the action that happened at the, at the, at the director's house of PICO the other day, an example of how we're trying to get them to have green transitions? Like, what, what has been, like, I, I know what we've been doing on the side of, like, PICO and the hearings um, and PUC, but regarding that particularly, that need to get the energy leaders to have green transition plans. Where do you feel like we are with PICO in that and what kind of are things yeah. that have been done for that, towards that end? Good question. I mean, PICO's basically been completely unmovable over four years of a pretty intense escalating campaign. We use both an inside and outside game in all of our campaigns. So we've had a lot of direct actions in the Power Local Green Jobs campaign. I mean, literally over 200 direct actions we had a 100 mile walk for climate justice and jobs through PICO service territory, kind of telling the story of dirty fossil fuel and the transition to renewable energy, very powerful. Uh, that walk was ended with our executive director, uh, Bishop Royster and Bill McKibben, who was a global um, founder of 350.org and also um, of, you know, um, just global environmental movement walking together, leading us in the pouring rain. We had about 300 people by the end of the walk um, through the pouring rain to Pico's office building. And you could see all the Pico employees looking out the window and Pico, Pico has paid so much attention to us. I mean, so much attention, but is um, unbudgeable on the actual energy decision issue, which is why we bumped the campaign up to Pico's regulator, the PUC. We gave PICO four years of a chance where we dialogued with the executives. We sat at tables with the executives. We had you know, endless actions outside the PICO office, you know, press releases, press conference. We gave PICO every possible you know, relational chance to step up, but PICO just can't and won't. They just can't be visionaries. They're kind of middle manager technocrats. And they care about profit. That's their kind of single organizing principle. They extract a million dollars a day to their uh, parent owner, Exelon, which is based in Chicago, from our own energy needs. So a million dollars a day extracted from our community, sent off to Chicago and Pico. So we, we knew we could either go to Exelon as our next escalation, or we could go to the PUC, because those are the two, if you bump it up, the two organizations that had some higher level influence over PICO. And so we're right now taking on the PUC, which is at the state level, and that's what's happening. And well, then, I, then I have a follow-up so question. Have I'm sorry, can I go? Yeah, please. No. Well, I guess, I guess, I don't, I don't want to derail the conversation because I know we have a time frame here, but uh, I think it, like when you tell that story about Pico not budging and then going to PUC instead of Exelon. Um, I mean, I think that like, I think it brings up a lot of strategic questions about um, like, why would Pico budge considering the fact that I think a lot of uh, visions of a truly green and just transition means their ultimate destruction like like i don't think there's I, i'm not sure i think some people would wonder if there's any way that they could like be reformed or change and still end up with a just green transition um and so it does seem like to me like it makes a lot yeah. more sense to be talking to 
the, the public institutions that would regulate them uh, or, or, or help in their ultimate destruction. Right. So um, yeah. So I guess I just always wondered whenever, not just about power or anything, I just wondered always about the, the utility in trying to talk directly to Pico, like, like how that would, yeah. uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, those are really good questions. And we, we, I do know what you mean. And I, first of all, want to invite everybody here into, we will be having a strategy retreat for the next arc of this Power Local Green Jobs campaign with Equate. I just was um, helping design that uh, yesterday with, with Equate. And so that we will have two sessions. One will be on sort of how we got to where we are in that campaign. And the second will be on where are we gonna go from here, just to engage everybody in thinking those kind of questions through. And that will be after the election this fall, because we have to be all hands in um, up until then on our team and all through power. So after the election, hopefully, soon after the election, we will have these um, opportunities to really delve deep. And usually those are facilitated, really excellent strategy retreats that kind of enlist us all in learning and thinking about our options. I will say one other thing about that, Colson, though, thank you for raising that question, is that we do see a possible role for PICO in the future, even in an economy that had much more energy democracy, which means that maybe many local places owned their sources of energy and still sell it um, to PICO. Or if we want a community solar framework legally in the state, which is another something we need, uh, where there can be arrays of solar panels that are somewhat owned by communities, but it's also helpful to have an anchor institution like PICO that kind of is an expert in how you do energy, um, also co-owning that. And you know how you, dis all, it's the devil is in the details, but like we're very committed to energy democracy, which means actually that local communities own their sources of energy and can profit from it and reinvest it in their own communities. But it's possible that there's some kind of partnering way if people would kind of join us we could problem solve together and we could move forward together the problem is pico's never even committed to the goal that is our vision of you know drastically expanding the solar energy part of the pie if pico would commit to the goal we could work very cooperatively together and come up with some solutions that worked for um, many many different interests and, and to that point, and i know we're not going to have a huge amount more time here but i want to quickly cover two other because we have four local campaigns that we're part of and each of them surges at different times so we're not always actively doing anything about any one of them but i do want to mention a third campaign which has to do with our uh, with septa our transportation system proposing a gas plant in a very environmentally uh, burdened and it's uh, actually labeled by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, an environmental justice neighborhood because it's so multiply burdened by poverty, by racism, by all the things I've mentioned before, underinvestment in education, over-policing, mass incarceration, terrible health outcomes, and toxic pollution. So it's officially a designated community by the Environmental Protection Agency and it's already being multiply burdened and SEPTA decided to propose and build a gas plant right there to spew out more emissions. This is the nice town neighborhood of Philadelphia. That gas plant is mostly built already and power and allies contested every single stage of that process, every permit, every city council permission, every zoning hearing, we were there we packed the hearing rooms. We contested, we contested. We, it was kind of, we know we win some, we lose some. It was mostly a losing struggle, but we have one last thing lurking in the wings, which is that there's one last permit that they're waiting to decide whether SEPTA gets or doesn't get. It's out of our hands now. It's from the um, licensing and inspection department. We already fought very hard against it, weighed in with lots of testimony and presence, and now they get to decide. But in the meantime, we used a civil rights law and we charged environmental racism. And we, we, we applied to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, to, to consider this as environmental racist issue and to prevent that gas plant from opening in Nicetown. And the EPA answered us and said, we will look at your 
request after this last permit is ruled on. And we are just waiting endlessly for that last permit to be ruled on. It should have been a year ago that they made a decision. I don't really know what's holding it up. But, you know, if that permit allows the thing to go forward, which it probably will, because every other permit's been approved against our will, we will then open this legal challenge through the EPA using a civil rights law charging environmental racism. So, you know, we're not going down without a big fight. That's the third local campaign. Nothing's happening at this exact moment in that area. And then the fourth campaign, I will just touch on very briefly, but it's been a huge people's victory, is the Right to Breathe campaign, which is led by Philly Thrive around the refinery, the biggest gas refinery on the East Coast that formerly was the PES refinery. I don't know if people have followed this, but on June 21st of last year, 20 exploded in endangering millions of lives in Philadelphia with toxic chemicals. Very, very dangerous. The Right to Breathe campaign had already been organizing deeply in the footprint of that refinery, calling for it to be closed down. It was so mismanaged for 150 years, so mismanaged, just profit being extracted with no concern for the health of the community very high asthma and cancer rates right there where the fumes just coat your lungs and coat your cars. And so for a few years, the Right to Breathe campaign already had been calling for that um, refinery to shut down. Then it exploded. The mayor and the powers that be in the corporation all said, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's no problem, and kept the plant open for three days. And we were in the streets, in the coalition, led by the people in the footprint of that area, through Philly Thrive, uh, calling for the closure of the plant. Three days later, the mayor succumbed to people pressure and said, okay, the plant has to be closed. It's gonna be closed. But then the question was whether they were gonna reopen it. Then they, the, the people who owned it were bankrupt anyway. So they, they went into bankruptcy and they had to do something with it to sell the land. It's a vast tract of land right on on the river down there in Philadelphia, very polluted, and they were going to have to sell it. So then the question was, was another refinery going to buy it? There was an auction in New York. We bust people up. It was quite dramatic. We sort of invaded the corporate offices in New York where this auction was happening and, and did lots of messaging and lots of direct action. Uh, Power, Philly Thrive, other allies, um, very powerful. And we basically were saying to the mayor, the city council, any corporation that was bidding, we were saying to the world, you know, do not open a fossil fuel plant here. We will lay down our bodies. We will contest every permit. We will sue you. You know, every step of the way, we will make mass disruption. We will contest our energy future here. And they listened. I mean, we made it a lot of trouble for any kind of new fossil fuel refinery to reopen a fossil fuel plant. And just kind of when you think things can't change and won't change, this was a huge people's victory. That land is now owned by a non-fossil fuel developer, Hillco, based in Chicago. And this campaign continues, led by Philly Thrive, we wanted to be led by people right there in the footprint of the refinery. So we're in coalition on this one, led by people on the front line, organized by Philly Thrive. And so power takes the lead and participate. We take the lead from those people and we participate and show up. We amplify the messaging, like we'll join a letter writing campaign or we'll set up you know, city council visits or we'll bus up to New York or whatever. Like we get called into that and we have some liaisons to that. And that will be also, there will be needs in that just really to pay attention to how that development happens. So I think in our waning minutes here, I've covered the four current local campaigns. We also sit at various advisory tables and um, you know, we have a voice in many places on these issues in Philadelphia. Uh, we, we are part of the Alliance for a Just Philadelphia, which is a cross sector progressive organization like cross climate, cross incarceration, cross immigration, all those kind of things. So we're, we're there and that helps shape a platform for city council races. We're at various uh, government, local government tables and advisory places. So there's lots to do, whatever you're interested in, there's definitely something to do about it. 
um, room for all helping hands and um, you know, hearts, hands, and heads on these issues. But I've covered the four local, local actual campaigns that we take part in. We always work in partnerships. We're much stronger together if people are willing to join through our moral framework um, for racial and economic justice on a livable planet. So in our, our last couple minutes here, um, any questions, you can always um, join our team, our Climate Justice and Jobs team leadership list. So you'll get messages about team meetings. Uh, things also get posted on the power calendar, but most of the climate work goes through our team list. So that's a good place to, to stay connected to this work. You can email me at jgreenberg at powerinterfaith.org. Or interfaith.org if you aren't already on it. I think the people actually present here are already on that list. But if you're listening to the recording later, we also welcome you, if you're in Pennsylvania, to join that team list, um, which at the moment is our local Philadelphia team. We also will be building a state level team this year. And um, you can get connected at the moment through this list. Jay Greenberg at Power Philadelphia, powerinterfaith.org, either one. Any last questions or comments here? Let me take a quick round then of what was helpful for you in this session. I'm gonna ask what, what was helpful, what could be better? Those two final questions. We like to always build evaluation into the work so we can be a learning community. Let's start with what was helpful, what worked for you? I thought it was really valuable to hear all the different campaigns and especially broken down into, you know, local, regional, statewide. Um, I, I can't think of anything specific that would make it better except more voices from those campaigns maybe might be useful. Um, sometimes it's, it's good. I love listening to you, but sometimes it's good to have, you know, round robin effect of voices. So that would be the only thing. It's not, it's not you, Julie. <laughs> it's I just, hear you. All good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I like that first uh, list of building a new campaign criteria to look at. I, I've never seen that list, and I thought it would be very helpful. I also appreciate just the layout of the campaigns, what we're um, what we're working on right now, and a little bit more information about that. That was also my only real answer was the kind of layout and the breakdown, but also the history of them. So you get a sense of uh, like, like the, with the question I asked earlier, like why power takes the particular tack it takes, right? Like what's, what's the strategy and like what were the conversations in the past that led to this particular strategy, right? I yeah. really appreciated having the orientation at all. <clears throat> I can't hear you, Rory. Can you speak closer to your microphone? I appreciate having the orientation at, at all. I mean, I was just reflecting on that as you were talking, even before you asked the question of, oh, now I can sort of categorize some of the emails that I'm seeing. I can actually imagine like showing up to a monthly team meeting and like knowing sort of like the outline of what's happening. Um, so I really appreciate the first overview, overview umbrella and then the campaigns that are happening within that. I also really appreciated having this overview um, and it was very orienting. I think it would be helpful as a visual learner to have, as you're walking through the campaigns, to have some sort of handout um, or overflow, overview of what they are on a sheet of paper. Great. Well, one of the things we're hoping for is that more people on the team will have the overview of all the work, which is why I'm doing these orientations, because many people on our team hold one of the campaigns or a chunk of work. Like, and many people make great contributions, but very few people have the overall view. And we need more people who can message that out and kind of hold that big comprehensive picture of overall, what is this team doing? Why? How? Um, so that's partly why we're expanding these orientations onto all of this circle and beyond um, so that we're building that ripple effect. 
thank you for ideas for how to go into the future with this. And I may be calling on some of you to help implement them. So really good. We're actually going to end with our same theme song, just to frame it and have that strand of, of continuity. And I want to thank again, Rory, for being my admin tech support, um, magical elf behind the scenes or <laughs> whatever. And um, we'll end with the song. Thank you all. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle around to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds to change the life from deep within the earth. It is time now. It is time now that we fly. It is time we lead ourselves into the well. It is time now, and what a time to be alive in this great turning. We shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive. Turning, we shall learn to lead.